I was born in a little community called South Allen, south of Allen uh, in Saskatchewan in 1932. And uh, my older brothers and sisters were born in the States. And I have five brothers and three sisters. Uh, today, I have only one brother. And uh, there are just the two of us out of the nine children now. My uh, parents moved up from the States. My mother was only two years old when they immigrated from Germany to uh, South Dakota. My father was 17 when he immigrated to South Dakota from Odessa, where he was born. And many years later, Ed and I visited the place he was born, and I couldn't help thinking, except for the grace of God, I might have been born there. How lucky we were to be chosen to be born in Canada. All my mother's family lived in the States, and uh, only my uh, father and his sister immigrated to North America. She, for some reason, immigrated to Canada, and he to the States. And she forever wanted her brother to move to Canada. She was so lonely. And so my father finally succumbed, and I don't know how he ever talked my mother into leaving her entire family and everything she knew and, and moved to Canada. And it was very difficult because uh, they started with nothing and, uh, you know, had to build a, a house. And uh, they were fortunate enough to meet a man by the name of Fred Smith who uh, put them on a farm and uh, my father worked for him, taking care of all his animals that were grazing on the graze land. And uh, eventually uh, eked out a, a reasonably good living, although it was a rural area. And uh, we were so isolated, 14 miles from the closest town. We lived on a farm. We had um, animals. We had horses and cows and chickens and pigs. and. Uh, a very large garden, and we didn't know we were poor because everybody that lived around us lived the way we did. And uh, Sunday would be uh, uh, an absolute no work day, and we'd socialize, we'd all get together at someone's home, and we played ball and all kinds of uh, activities, and we had a very happy childhood. And we just thought the rest of the world lived like that. I was always interested in reading, uh, and uh, our parents encouraged us uh, to, uh, uh, to do well at school. So if I didn't want to do chores, all I had to do was pick up a book. And, uh, and I've always, always enjoyed the outdoors, picking berries, which we did a lot of. Uh, we had Saskatoon berries and gooseberries and wild berry, choke cherries that grew in our area. And I like gardening, I like to um, work with plants. And I was always uh, uh, involved in sports. I enjoyed playing ball, and I played not only with the high school team, but with the uh, town uh, of Allen, with the team. And uh, cycling, of course, was always a big thing because we didn't have cars. Going to the country dance, and we did a lot of curling in the winter. Of course, it was ball in the summer and curling in the winter. And Saturday night meant a dance somewhere. And if there wasn't one in Allen, there'd be one in Elstow or Bradwell or one of the surrounding communities. And when I went to Allen, um, I went to a public school. Uh, and the uh, I had never met a nun before, but the principal at this public school was a nun. She was also the drama teacher, and the uh, music teacher was a nun. And uh, I admired them greatly. Uh, the drama teacher was exceptionally good, and our little community won the Provincial Drama Award that year. And uh, I was one of a cast of three. And uh, subsequently we got, uh, or I at least took advantage of it when I was at the 
uh, University of Saskatchewan. I took uh, drama lessons from uh, Professor Jones and Mary Ellen Burgess because uh, I really enjoyed it, and I thought perhaps that might be a field I would go into, but I couldn't afford that. <laughs> the education system was uh, a one-room schoolhouse that taught all eight grades, and when I passed my grade eight, I had to take my nine and 10 by correspondence, and then in order to take 11 and 12, I had to leave home and move into town, 14 miles away. And I lived with an older couple there, a childless couple. And uh, I earned my room and board by uh, working for them. I did the cleaning and laundry and helped with the cooking. And he was the caretaker at the church and uh, art and bridge player. And now and then they couldn't stop the game. And uh, it was his responsibility to ring the Angelus bell at six o'clock. And so I had to learn how to do that because on many occasions, I ended up ringing the Angelus bell. I remember my two brothers leaving when they joined up. And it didn't mean anything to me until they brought in the um, uh, uh, rationing. And my father used a lot of sugar in his coffee and he couldn't go without coffee and those items were rationed and I can remember we were no longer allowed to use sugar because we saved it for for dad for his coffee and uh, we had uh, uh, neighbors who didn't buy all their rations and it was not uncommon for neighbors to give away their coupons to someone who was short of ration uh, groceries and that's about my memory. And I can remember my father uh, being tuned into the news morning, noon, and night. And he had a map on the wall, and everything was marked with, uh, um, with colored pics. And I can remember him stressing the fact that it was more than a country we lived in. It was a world, and we had to know where the different countries were and uh, where the battles were. From there, I moved to Saskatoon for my post-secondary education and again had to work my way through. I had a cousin who was uh, uh, the cook at Lynbrook Inn, which was a catering service. And in the evening and on the weekend, I could help her. And uh, I did that all through school. I, I took business and then decided I couldn't afford four years of schooling. And uh, I didn't finish my degree. I went on to a place called Success Business College, which had a very compressed program. And I graduated from that. And uh, my, uh, 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 my focus was accounting. And when I graduated, I, uh, my first job, <laughs> was at the Toronto Dominion Bank on uh, 2nd Avenue South in Saskatoon. And uh, three years later, I went to work as the accountant at a wholesale hardware, Walter Woods. And that's where I met my husband. And we've been married for, it'll be 65 years in November. I like working with figures. I like to make them work. I like to see what you can do with them. And my father, I guess, was just an, uh, an excellent mathematician. He didn't ever use a pencil. And uh, he would throw out figures and he would expect us to be able to do it uh, without pen and paper. And I was rather fascinated with figures. It wasn't his job to, uh, uh, to do anything with the accounting. But he always, uh, the company he was working for bought uh, furnaces from the company I was working for. And that was his department. But now he'd always find some excuse to come into the accounting department to check their balance or whatever, even though it didn't relate to his work. And, and that's where I first met him. Well, I wasn't playing hard to get as much as that. I was, um, I was dating uh, someone else at the time on a steady basis. And I remember our first date was a picnic 
And the, uh, the manager of the heating department was so anxious for this relationship to take, he just felt it would be good for his end of the business. And I can remember him saying, oh, you're going out to picnic? Um, here, take this radio with you. And he took a radio off the shelf and gave it to us to take along on the picnic for music. <laughs> Ed was not a dancer. I miss that a whole lot. We often spend the weekend uh, driving out into the country uh, to visit his family who lived out at Watrous. And we didn't, uh, you know, spend a whole lot of time because I was often working weekends and uh, evenings uh, as well as my own job. And he was out of town a lot with his job. I suppose I always told my parents I will never marry a farmer because I felt life on the farm left so much to be desired. And he left home because he was not going to stay on the farm. So we certainly had that in common. You see, my mother was no long, you know, had died years prior to that. And uh, uh, my father liked him right off the bat. Uh, and there was never a question. It was, everything was just fine. Uh, it wasn't quite the same with some of his family because he was Lutheran and I was Catholic. And uh, so this was going to be a mixed marriage. And uh, eventually we overcame all that. We got married in Saskatoon on uh, supposedly a long weekend. We got married November the 10th and the 11th was a, uh, a weekend. And our reception was the first one uh, at the uh, Golden Star, which was a brand new facility there. And it was a beautiful fall. The flowers were still blooming on the, you know, in November in Saskatoon. It was really a nice day. And uh, some of my uh, uh, family came up from the States. And I remember Ed's brother, who was a very quiet kind of guy, had lived with us since we'd gotten, uh, uh, well, after we were married, until he got married. And uh, he was going to take care of our car to make sure that nobody would do anything to the car. And so it's the first time I'm sure that Will ever had more than one drink. And by the time the evening was over, he couldn't remember where he left the car. And we left the reception, we slipped out a side door, and I'm in a dark alley while Ed is walking up and down the streets looking for our car. And it took a long time till he, but he finally found the car. And a very apologetic Wilf came to the hotel the next morning because even then he wasn't sure where he left the car. I almost felt as if I'd, I'd been a mother because when my mother died, I had two young brothers and uh, they were only uh, 11 and 15. And my father could not look after them on the farm. And so they came to Saskatoon and they lived with me. And uh, lived with us and when we got married, Ed's brother came with him, his young brother, and so there were the five of us from day one. So, uh, you know, I was accustomed to looking after other people, looking after feeding them and doing laundry and all those kinds of things. So motherhood was not new, and David was the best baby anybody could have. Uh, and I just thought babies were all like that. And Cindy was a good baby. And then along, 10 years later, along came Robert. And he showed me what a child really could be like. <laughs> David was growing up. He's got his father's personality. And we always said, David's going to be a social worker because that's his nature. Cindy is a combination of the two. Robert is, Robert can't let a good deal go by. Oh, you know, I just got to do it. And uh, runs much too hard, I think. And is only happy if he's really 
uh, got an agenda that uh, has him running from morning till night. Cindy's kind of a combination of the two boys. Well, we always camped. Um, from the time Robert was born, we had a, our first uh, camper. And every summer, as soon as they were out of school, we'd go to the Okanagan. We'd go to Penticton, actually, and, uh, you know, expose them to the difference uh, between the prairies and, and the Okanagan, uh, to see fruit grow and uh, all the different things, um, uh, be able to swim in the water and boat. And they always had a dinghy that they took with them. And uh, later on, David had a little, uh, you can't call it a motorbike, an electric uh, or a motorized bike. And uh, we always took that along. And it was important to camp with them all the time. And then in 72, when we bought our first place in Hawaii, we'd go with the children for Christmas and for New Year's. And so they literally grew up there, or felt that they did, because we spent, uh, they were there twice a year, every year. And we worked very hard when we weren't traveling, and I just felt we had to get away. It was an investment in mental health, because we worked 16-hour days, seven days a week, and for many years, uh, I'm sure we had about three stores at this time, I was still doing all the books and all the buying, and, and there were no computers. It was all done by hand. And so at night when everybody went to bed, I'd be at the dining room table doing the books. And uh, early morning, getting the orders ready to phone them in. And then get the children off to school, and after they were off to school, I'd go to the office and I'd come home. That was the nice thing about having your own business. I'd come home and be there when they came from school. I felt strongly about you have to give back. Uh, if you're blessed in any way, you really owe it to give it back. And uh, in the early days, it was like home and school. Another gal and I started the first home and school in Grand Prairie. And, uh, you know, to be part of the uh, Mother's Committee for the Brownies and, uh, you know, support the hockey. And, and I was the chairman of the tri -Bock Festival for Northern Alberta, which involved fundraising. We brought high-profile uh, acts to, uh, to Grand Prairie, the uh, uh, Vienna Boys Choir, uh, Beverly Sills, who has since passed away, uh, the, uh, uh, the singers from London, England, the King Singers. I was on the uh, provincial uh, for three or four years. I was on the uh, vocational and technical training committee. And then I was appointed to uh, college affairs and I served seven years on that, five as a um, chairman. And then I was um, appointed to the Provincial Student Finance, and I did that for six years. And uh, I was appointed to the University Senate, the University of Alberta, and I did that for two terms, which was six years. We gave Mother Teresa an honorary degree, and since I was on the committee, we met and gowned in the same room, and I got to spend a few private moments with her. And we had spent a lot of time preparing uh, an elaborate luncheon with uh, all the bishops of Western Canada and the politicians and dignitaries. But after the morning session, Mother Teresa asked for a sandwich in a quiet room because she'd been so busy she didn't have time to pray. And so, the guest of honor was having her lunch by herself, and we were left with, with this great display. Uh, it made quite a statement, because I think it was something that I saw so many people in my community where I grew up not able to take advantage of it. And uh, I, just, I just felt if, uh, if there was a niche where I could, have a voice and where my voice might matter. Ed sold a piece of property to Joe Young, who 
was the franchisee in Saskatoon. Now, I had known Joe uh, when he was taking pictures on the street. Joe was an orphan. And uh, the Colonel, <laughs> the Colonel liked us. And he, he'd say to us, you're the kind of people that should be selling my chicken. And we'd go home and chuckle, you know. We grew up on a farm, both of us. And if we wanted chicken, chicken dinner on Sunday, you'd butcher a chicken. I mean, who heard of somebody cooking it for you and bringing it in? And we chuckled and we chuckled. And the Colonel stayed on to us. And we were just moving north. Ed was going north with, te with uh, Texaco. And the Colonel said, I'll give you all the northern Alberta. First, he tried to get us to go to Vancouver. <laughs> we didn't have two nickels to rub together. And so, anyway, when we went to Grand Prairie, I thought it was the end of the world. There, you know, there was no jet service, there was no television, there wasn't even a decent road in. <clears throat> and Ed kept saying, well, you'd like to cook and you can do your own books. Well, you know, maybe this would take the slack out of your life. So we bought this little drive in and Ed probably told you about it and with our humble beginning. And everybody thought about Colonel Sanders as Aunt Jemima, you know, a picture on a box. We had no television. And then when TV came to Grand Prairie, our business exploded. And I said to Ed, you know, I can't operate out of this little place. We have to have uh, a new store. And uh, we built, uh, I don't know how many stores, about seven the first 15 years. And we not only, we not only operated store hours, we went into the catering service. And we had a big catering division. And then when Procter & Gamble uh, opened their mill uh, six miles south of Grand Prairie. They had Canadian Bechtel build the mill. They had 500 men. We fed them seven days a week, 24 hours. They ran 24 hours. Uh, so it was, a, it was a lot of work. It isn't an easy industry, and 55 years is longevity in, uh, in food. Oh, we did. He was so good to us. He was so incredibly good to us. And when he sold out, he wrote up a 20-year contract for us that was ironclad. And uh, Pepsi tried to break it and couldn't. And we got to know his children. The girls visited us in Hawaii. They visited us in Grand Prairie. We stayed with him when we went to the Kentucky Derby. And uh, Ed and I are both honorary colonels. And. Uh, but he was just, he was just a, an incredible individual that we were so fortunate to get to know. Uh, Mildred and Margaret Ruggles, the Colonel's daughters, had been to Hawaii and they had stayed in Kona at the old Kona Inn. And they wrote a letter and I wish David had saved it to David. Uh, now and then they correspond and uh, corresponded about certain things and and they said you know this is the kind of place your mother would love and I just from my first time I went there I just had a feeling that I belonged there and so we bought it and of course he enjoyed it as much or more than I did and uh, we used the condo Christmas and Easter and then we let friends and relatives use it. Uh, we didn't ever rent it out. Uh, it was just something that was there to be enjoyed. And then when they uh, sold the first lots, the first gated community in Kona, it always wanted to build uh, a house on a minus lot. And so we bought the lot and built the house. and. We'd gone to all the other islands and spend time on all of them. But Kona was the only place that we really liked. The diversity, the people, uh, the ruralness of it, uh, so many things about it. And I guess 
the weather. It is so constant, it gets less rain than anywhere on the islands, and we just liked it. And still do. Still my favorite place in the world. I found uh, my uh, itinerary the other day, the very first trip I took right after I graduated. Went to California. That was always my dream to see the ocean. And uh, we had never, ever missed a year. We do without the new car or the new furniture or whatever, but we always took a trip. Well, for many, for many years, I uh, collected uh, liqueur bottles, uh, liqueurs, different liqueurs from different countries. Every country we go to, I would buy a liqueur, like this is from uh, uh, Austria. And of course, the golf ball is from Scotland. And, uh, and this is uh, quite an unusual one. There's the President of the United States seal right into the bottle of wine here. And I got that right out of um, the fridge at their uh, box office at the Kennedy Center. There's a, it opens up into a little living room and a bathroom and kitchen. And uh, I was visiting my girlfriend, Lynn Sunseth, who was working for Reagan in the Oval Office at the time. And so that was uh, a very interesting experience. And I, from there, I went on to uh, Washington. And uh, from Washington, I'm sorry, I went on to New York because one of the uh, presidents that I met during my uh, provincial work with uh, post-secondary education had been uh, uh, transferred to, uh, the, or got a job at the UN. And he always said, you've got to come down and visit while I have this interesting job. And since I already had uh, uh, my clearance in uh, Washington, I went on to New York and uh, Dr. Matthews said, oh, I'm so sorry. The UN is in session and even those of us who work there can't get in. And then he said something, but that wouldn't stop you, would it, Terry? And I had this White House clearance, so I felt that I should be able to get into the UN. So I go there, and of course, I can't get in. And uh, I plead my case, and I said, now Joe Clark had just been appointed as Canada's ambassador to the United Nations after he was defeated. And I said, I'm a constituent of Joe Clark's. Uh, which was stretching it just a little bit because I wasn't, but my brother was. And I thought that was close enough. And so anyway, uh, eventually they let me go in with the Canadian Press Corps. And Joe Clark was the only one who got a standing ovation that day. And he spoke, now this is a long time ago, he spoke about apartheid in South Africa. Never, never in my wildest dreams, and none of these things were ever planned. They just kind of seemed to happen. And, uh, you know, there are, as, I, as I reflect on my life, I just think there were so many incredible things that just happened that were not planned that way and just turned out, you know, so well, including meeting Colonel Sanders which, you know, became such a big part of our life. I guess my parents, you know, they had a good sense of value. They had a strong work ethic. And um, they had a pride in accomplishment. And uh, I just think uh, sometimes um, adults um, rob young people of that pride rather than making them work for it so they can say, I accomplished this. They're, they're too willing to do it for them or make it too easy for them. Now, it might be an old-fashioned idea, but uh, I, just, I just know what that has done for me. And that was something that was instilled in us. And I, I hope we were able to pass some of that on. 
Make use of your God-given talents. Don't feel that anybody owes you anything. If the government doesn't owe you anything, your community doesn't owe you anything, the opportunities are out there and uh, just go out and get them. I, I, I just would hope that they all are self-sufficient and uh, grow up with, uh, uh, with some sense of responsibility to their fellow man. I'm so proud of the fact that we have three children that are really good community citizens. And you know, they've all three have very, you know, good solid marriages and raise good children. And, and I don't think you can ask for anything more. We have eight grandchildren and eight great grandchildren. And the great grandchildren uh, range from uh, Let's see, he's about uh, eight months now to uh, 10 years. I would never have dreamed, I just never have dreamed that that would happen. I just feel very blessed and grateful each day.